So I see that we've got folks starting to come in. I'm excited to see you all. Um, my name is Michelle. I'm the program director here at Washington National Cathedral, and we're so thrilled that you are here to join us for Long Long Way Part One tonight. Um, would love for you to drop your name and where you're from in the chat. Make sure you choose in the drop down that you're sending a chat to the panelists and the attendees. Otherwise, only the panelists will see what you put. And we would love to see who you are and where you're from, but would love even more for everyone to see who the range of folks are who are joining us. And I know that a number of you uh, might know uh, Professor Garrett from Baylor. We'd love to know if you are someone who is has a particular connection to either of the panelists, that might be fun to see too. And that way they can also see who's jumping on to join us tonight. So. I'm gonna keep chatting for just a minute so people who are still coming on, don't worry that there is no sound because there is sound, so you should be able to hear. And it looks like we've got folks from all over the place. This is fantastic. So I'm gonna start letting y'all know I don't see our numbers driving up too quickly. So we are, we're in a webinar form, which means that the panelists are the only folks that you'll see and we'll bring on our two guests in just a moment. But want to make sure that you all know that we've got a couple of folks, uh, Caitlin Toner in particular, and also Margaret Rawls, who will be with you in the chat. So if you have questions about how things are going or want to just talk amongst yourselves, respond to what the panelists are saying, please use the chat function to do that. Um, we're not so overwhelmingly large tonight that that won't work. If you have a particular question for either uh, the Reverend Canon Kelly Brown Douglas, or a question for Professor Garrett, you can use the Q&A function and you can find that at the bottom of the video screen with the two thought bubbles where it says Q&A. Go ahead and open that. That's where we'll be taking your questions from and uh, Canon Leonard Hamlin will join us towards the end of the evening so that we can include him and he'll be bringing your questions into the room as it were. So hi. I think, um, Margaret, let's go ahead and bring everybody on and get started. Um, as we're doing that, <laughs> I do want to let everybody know. So Professor Greg Garrett is in the middle of an ice storm in Austin, Texas. <laughs> so he is in his car at the moment. He has driven to find an internet signal from a local church. So <laughs> we, will, we, we will keep our fingers crossed and say some prayers <laughs> that Greg will be with us for as much of this time as possible. And uh, we, we ask you to extend your graciousness to, uh, uh, to this experience. Yeah. And we will um, we'll hope that he is with us for as long as possible. And we, at some point, just so y'all know, we might ask him to turn his video off. So Greg, we'll let you know if it turns out to be a little too much on our end uh, in terms of that stop and start. So you look good for right now. And I'm gonna ask Margaret to add another T onto the end of Garrett so that we spell your oh. name. <laughs> uh, okay, so folks, here we are. This is the um, fifth annual Long Long Way program that uh, Greg Garrett and the Reverend Canon Kelly Brown Douglas and I initiated at Washington National Cathedral um, at the very beginning of uh, Greg's desire to begin studying and writing about movies that address race and culture as part of his long trajectory of theology and culture. And this turned out to be a chapter that Kelly and I got to join um, in, in yeah. quite a bit of existence. So we are excited about that. The original premise of the Long Long Way event at the National Cathedral was to take a, a historical film in an anniversary year, pair it with a current film and talk about how things had changed, how we had come perhaps a long, long way and had perhaps a long, long way yet to go in, in terms of race and equity. And that film is one of the ways which we can measure or not some of the progress mm -hmm. that happened during that time. So, now that we're in COVID era, it was a little more challenging to imagine what we might do to screen conversations. But fortunately, Greg has written a book called uh, Long Long Hollywood's, A Long Long Way, Hollywood's Unfinished Journey, 
uh, to racial reconciliation. Did I get that right, Greg? It's a lot of words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't make okay. There it is. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Reverend Ken and Kelly Brown Douglas. Um, and I will tell you about both of these books in, by means of introduction in just a second. Um, so tonight we have the opportunity to dive more deeply into some of the overall themes that have been consistently part of our conversations over the last few years. So every single year we've talked about these larger themes, these themes of history, the ways that film says or doesn't say um, much about our current state of race relations, what we might learn from film and what it means overall. Mm -hmm. So tonight is really the opportunity to, to ask Greg to talk a little bit more about his journey with the book and to ask the Reverend Ken and Kelly Brown Douglas, who's also been part of that journey and is also a film watcher to share mm -hmm. her thoughts about the overlap between race and culture and film and what that might mean for us today. So with that, I'm going to do a tiny bit of introduction. Greg, as I have said, uh, is a professor at Baylor University, theologian in residence at the American Cathedral in Paris, and a prolific writer about um, many things culture. And so we're going to get to hear from him particularly about this book. The Reverend Canon Kelly Brown Douglas is the canon theologian at Washington National Cathedral, which is how I know her and have known her for a number of years is also the Dean of Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary in that and the Bill and Judith Moyers chair in Kelly help me mm. with the rest of the, the the full name of the chair position there. Bill and Judith Moyers uh, professor of public theology at Union Theological Seminary. Great, perfect, thank you. So I have the great privilege of counting both of you as friends and collaborators and colleagues and have really enjoyed the conversations we've had over the last several years. So I'm looking forward to tonight as well. So great, we're gonna start with you. Why this book and what do you hope people are gonna take away from it? Good, and, and uh, let me just say, Michelle, wave at me or let me know if you need me to uh, get rid of my video. Uh, and, and I am so grateful to be with my friends, Michelle and, and Kelly, and uh, to be back for this, this iteration of Long, Long Way, um, even though I am sitting in an ice storm in a parking lot. So <laughs> we'll, it's, uh, instead of my carefully curated bookcase, we, we, uh, we have the inside of my Prius. And uh, so we'll just, we'll, we'll make that do. And uh, I wanna welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being with us tonight for what we hope will be a wonderful and, and powerful conversation about racism in America, about Hollywood film, American culture, and about American history. Um, this book uh, grew out of um, two really important things, uh, one of which, as, as Kelly and Michelle know, is my own sort of long journey uh, with race as uh, somebody who grew up in the American South. And uh, so I was um, a, a person who discovered race and racism very early on, just in terms of injustice and unfairness uh, in, in the schools uh, that I attended in Atlanta and Charlotte. And then um, at a, a later period in my life, I was rescued um, by St. James Episcopal Church, which is the historically African-American church in East Austin. And when they rescued me and patched me up and sent me back out into the world, um, they made it clear that what faith is supposed to be allied to is justice. Uh, that that's an essential part of our gospel message. And so personally, this is a really important thing that I uh, am drawn to. And then as both Michelle and Kelly know, uh, this grew out of uh, a program that I did with an Episcopal church in uh, inner city, Wilmington, Delaware, uh, where I was invited to lead a weekend of conversation about film with um, a, a blended congregation led by my friend, David Andrews. And uh, this was a, a, a white church and an African-American church that had been brought together in Wilmington. And uh, David said, you know, we, we do lots of things well together. We worship well together. We work uh, for peace and justice together, but we've never been able to have the really hard conversations. And I think if you come in and show us some films about race and prejudice and help us have some conversation, that that, that might be a really powerful thing. And, and it was an incredibly powerful thing. And by uh, the end of the first night, after we had watched Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which is one of the films that we showed in our first year together at Washington National Cathedral, um, I had emailed my editor at Oxford University Press and said, I know what the next book is gonna be. 
Um, I want to dig deep into this project of race and film, and I want to make it possible for people to have these same kinds of conversations. And that was what I came to Michelle and Kelly uh, to talk about, to say, this is something I think we need to do in the nation's house of worship. And so that, that's where the book came from. And it's, it is the product of, as Michelle said, five years of collaboration uh, between the three of us, uh, dear friends and partners in this work. And uh, this book absolutely would not be possible without you two and without Washington National Cathedral. And uh, so I'm, I'm so grateful that we can use it as a way uh, to launch some really important conversations for this year's festival. Super, so what are the, if, if you, what do you want people to take away from the book, right? So that's the story of how mm. we got here, right? What's the, if somebody's reading your book, what's the, what are the things you want them to walk away with? Okay, um, so this is something that Kelly and I talk about a lot, um, but because Tony Morrison is smarter than both of us, uh, I'm gonna refer to Tony. Um, she says in this, um, this marvelous book, The Origin of Others, Narrative fiction provides a controlled wilderness, an opportunity to be and to become the other, the stranger, with sympathy, clarity, and the risk of self-examination. What great shared stories let us do is to have really hard conversations about all the things that matter. And, and that's what these films have done for us every year and, and in all of the other places where I've helped to, to program these uh, in the program that Kelly and I do in New York City. Um, shared story is a way for us to bypass some of these very rigid walls that we put up and to, to have uh, incredible empathy and sympathy and understanding. And uh, so this is the thing that I hope more than anything else is that um, by talking about film as a vehicle for shared meaning uh, and for us to be able to talk about race and justice, um, prejudice in America, American history, um, and um, theology, which at, at its deepest level is simply who are we called to be? Uh, who do we understand ourselves to be? What is it that we're supposed to be doing in this life? Um, I, I think that film makes that possible in a really profound and powerful way. And, and that has been our experience together. And that, that is my biggest thing. Um, and in all the conversations I've had about the book and in the writing of the book, all the conversations that went into the writing, um, that, that has been my biggest thing is that hope that it could lead us to some really profound and transformational conversations. Great. So the book is a vehicle for, for transformation. And so I'm going to pause there. And uh, Kelly, I want to ask you because you've been on this journey with Greg, right? Not only at the cathedral, but also at Trinity and talked with him a number of times. So what, do, what are you hoping that people will take away from the book? Yeah, thank you, uh, Michelle, for the question. And I thank everybody uh, for joining us this evening. And of course, uh, thank you, Greg, for uh, your work and uh, initiating in some respects this conversation. And so I want to sort of begin there, uh, Michelle, in that, uh, you know, film uh, and going to the movies, uh, which may be a thing of the past uh, as we get past the pandemic and people are so used to now watching films in a singular kind of way on, on uh, their computers or wherever. But film is an opportunity for convening different people, right? And, and hopefully then from that convening, we have conversation. Well, when I think of this journey uh, with Greg and this book, first of all, imagine really my shock and maybe my appall when I get an email from a white Southern guy asking me, whom I don't know, uh, asking me if I want to do a discussion and do a series on race and film. And I'm like, really? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, why would you ask me to do that? And uh, so I, I went into this quite skeptically. Uh, uh, and yet over the course of the five years or so, and you know, it seems like 
wow, I've known that person much longer than I've known that person. But over the course of our dialogues through film is how Greg and I began to develop a deeper relationship of understanding. And uh, we already had a mutual regard for the sacredness of each other's humanity. That always to me has to be the common ground. Uh, uh, and then we can move from there. So we already had that regard for one another, which is what bought, which made me say yes to being a part of this journey. And then that deepened beyond that. And that happened, Michelle, because and through our discussions about film. Needless to say, the conversations that Greg and I have had around race and culture that emerged out of film, he would not have been my chosen uh, conversation partner uh, with just ordinarily, right? And so that we've had conversations that because of film, because of, first of all, our, both our love for film, and I'm no film expert, he is, I'm just a film watcher, but because of our love for film and our commitments to not simply our sacred humanity, but to the sacred humanity of everybody and to a more just future. Because of those commitments, we were able to then dive into these discussions around film, which brought us into deeper relationship and deeper understandings and through uncomfortable conversations. And I, so I think what I would say, what people would get from the book is not a how do, it's not a how do book, how to be an anti-racist. Well, it, it's not that, uh, but I would hope that it's a book that says, you know what, film, it's not the panacea, but it can be one of the ways in which we can come together around something that we love and share and help us to have not simply difficult conversations, but to develop relationship through those mm -hmm. conversations. So I, as I said, it's from convening to conversation and hopefully from there to commun community. And that's what I have found in doing this for five years with, with you and Greg. Well, it sounds, what I'm loving about the way that you're both talking about this is that the your unusual conversation partners, right? And that you found a, a place of connection through persistence and respect and having something else to look at, right? Like I, I'm thinking about our world right now where Greg, you said that you were invited to do this the very first time because there was a community of people who hadn't had the really hard conversations yet, right? There's a whole lot of us right now who haven't had the really hard conversations. And so I'm really, I'm appreciating the witness that the two of you are right now, that that can happen from a foundation of respect and dignity, right? That that's, there's, there are hard conversations, but that if you have that foundation, then, then they're more possible. And Greg, I would, you've got a number of stories in your book about revelations that people yeah. have from these conversations where they're sitting in the, in the before times, they're sitting in a room, watching a film, talking to each other. Can you share a couple of those with us? Yeah, the, the one that I think of most often is, you know, I think it was our second, no, it was our first year when we showed Get Out. Um, and so we had showed Guess Who's Coming to Dinner on the first night, we showed Get Out on the second night. And I mean, honestly, you have not lived until you have shown a horror film in the nave of Washington National <laughs> Cathedral. That was so much fun. Um, but I, I have had this same experience several times. So I, I'm gonna tell two stories. And um, one of the things that I didn't lean into deeply in the response to your first question, Michelle, but one of the questions that Kelly often asked about our films was who is this made for? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I wanna highlight is that while I hope that there would be all sorts of people who would resonate with the critical commentary and the theological commentary in the book, it is, it is a book that is written from my perspective as a white middle-class, middle-aged man. And I have been invited over and over again to talk to white communities and white churches who want to do better uh, in, in terms of race and justice. And, and so most of my stories tend to revolve around people who look like me 
who have had transformational experiences in regard to these films about race and these conversations about anti-racism. And, and so the, the first story that I wanna tell has to do with one of my Baylor students from that, that first year. And uh, Baylor has been so generous to not only help uh, sponsor our program, but also to, to help send uh, Baylor undergrads to kind of, um, you know, to participate and to leaven the conversation back on my campus. And when we showed Get Out, which is this really powerful film, when we talked about it on stage, um, I mean, it is a film that Jordan Peele made largely for people that look like him, uh, because it's a film that is full of aggressions and microaggressions. But as I said on stage, the grace that he gives is that for people like me, because there's such a, a strong identification with the main character, we can also understand what he's going through. And so after we had finished this film, and, and Kelly, I don't know if you remember this at all, but I, I was sitting next to uh, one of my white co-eds and she turned to me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she was weeping. I mean, just like full, like full bore, bad mascara, you know, weeping. And, and she said, I, I have never before this moment understood what white people do to black people. And now I understand. And, and, and that is something that came from this shared story, this experience of watching the film together. And, and, and I think that this can happen and does happen. Um, you know, it, it happens when we, when we watch uh, Do the Right Thing. It happens when we watch 12 Years a Slave. There, there are all of these transformational possibilities for people who look like me to get it in ways that they could not get it starting from their own, uh, just like you know, their own starting places. But the story carries them into identification and understanding in ways that it hadn't happened before. Uh, and the other story that I wanna share with you and I think is also in the book um, is uh, from a weekend that I did in uh, downtown Houston. And so the Episcopal Cathedral there was one of our sponsors. And then there was a peace and justice um, a center in downtown Houston. And so we had people from all over Houston, but uh, the particular person that I wanna talk about was uh, uh, an elderly white woman. And uh, that weekend we were watching uh, guests who's coming to dinner, do the right thing and get out. And like she, the, she got more and more nervous as the weekend went on. And so she came up to me during the break after do the right thing, which is hard enough, you know, in its, in its, own, in its own sake. And she said, I can't watch this movie, Get Out. I've never watched a horror movie. And I said, you know, I, I totally respect that. I don't enjoy horror movies. Life is adventurous enough. You know, I, I don't personally need, you know, a, a bunch of additional horror in my life. But I will tell you this, if you watch this with us, it will give back to you in ways that you can't imagine at this moment. And, and she trusted me and she watched it. And I mean, like she watched much of it like this, which is how I typically watch horror movies, you know, like through my fingers. And then after it was over, I was talking with a, a black pastor who was my conversation pastor for the weekend. And we were talking about how Get Out is a movie that you have to watch more than once because it has so many surprises in it. And when we were talking about watching the movie more than once, she was shaking her head violently. Like I could see her on the front row shaking her head. And she was just saying to me, no, no, I can't possibly. And then after the movie was over, she came up to me and she said, you know, this was a really hard movie for me and I'm gonna watch it again because I live in a racist society and I want to understand how we can do better. And that, I mean, that in itself is powerful enough. I mean, that, that transformation that came from the film and the conversation. But after it was over, and the reason that I included it in the book is that somebody from the, the cathedral community, the, um, the Houston Episcopal Cathedral came up to me and said, do you know who that was? And of course I didn't, but they, they told me, and it's an old Houston family, you know, like, you know, friends of the bushes. And uh, she said, um, the really amazing thing is not just that she's here this weekend and not just that she watched these movies, she is a hundred years old. And it just like so many things came together for me. I mean, first, like her incredible courage. Like I hope at a hundred years old that I am still trying new things. But for me, it brought everything in the book into perspective because basically it's a hundred years from birth of a nation to get out. And that, that whole journey that's encompassed there and 
the many steps forward, even though there's still so much more to do. I, I saw it kind of encompassed in that amazing woman's life. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that for me is the amazing trajectory. You know, my, my 22 year old undergrad and this hundred year old woman watching her first horror film. <laughs> um, that, that is the amazing, powerful, transformational thing that can happen when we share these, these stories together. Well, and how often do, do we have that many generations in one place at one time, mm. right? Even, even prior to COVID, it's one of the things that I really appreciate about the church is that it's mm -hmm. at its best, it really is a place that is multi-generational and, and brings together people of, of not just different backgrounds, but of significantly different ages. And so I want to bring church a little bit more into this church and theology. And so Kelly, you look like you were getting ready to respond. So do you want to, oh. uh, do you want to add on or should I ask you a question? I wasn't, I was just clicking off my uh, uh, mute button, but, but one thing that that did bring to mind quickly, Michelle, was when you said uh, getting different generations in one space. I think the other thing that happens particularly in uh, our film festivals, if you will, uh, is that you're in, in a space where you get to see different people's reactions, right? And so that typically when we go to a theater to see a film and when it's black film, usually it's only black people that are going, uh, to, or you go where there are black people there uh, to, uh, and vice versa. Uh, and so, in a space like when we come together at the cathedral yeah. and it is a, a racially diverse audience. And it's interesting that to see the different reactions and, 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 and we've often in these conversations, uh, the, the white people in the audience have often commented on the black reactions and that's helped them to see and enter the film uh, differently. Mm -hmm. Well, and we often don't, I mean, speaking as a white person who, if I'm not intentional about it, I go see a film and mostly then I'm hearing about that film from people who are a lot like me, right? Mm -hmm. So even the panel conversations afterwards, when we're, be able to, we're able to watch a film together and ask some questions and have a bunch of different people respond to what's happening in that film to learn how differently that film is experienced depending on where you're coming from and what that's like. So, so Kelly, can you actually talk a little bit about that, right? So you have been with Greg in this conversation and Greg's talked a lot about what this, what this has meant for the white people <laughs> that he's engaged <laughs> with, right? So what's, um, what is it, can you speak a little bit about your experience of being in this conversation, what watching film is like for you, um, uh, why you've been invested in this with us because as you said at the very beginning you didn't have to be right <laughs> you started the journey and you decided to stick around so <laughs> well you know you stick around first of all you stick around because you know that other people are on this arc with you you know and i say that uh as i don't say uh, martin luther king um uh um paraphrased Theodore Parker when he said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And it is long, <laughs> but it does bend toward justice, which is the justice of God. Our task is to get on the ark. Uh, to just, you know, I say to people, just get on the ark. Uh, uh, and so, you know, as long as we're on this ark together, and, and that's what we've been through this, uh, on it together. And, and that's what's kept me on it because it's with people who are committed uh, to stay on it, uh, no matter how long uh, the arc is and just stay on the daggone arc. The uh, other thing, you know, for me through these conversations and through film, and again, I always wanna say film's not the panacea. You don't walk out of a film. You don't walk out of one of these weekends and say, oh, I've got it. Now I'm, uh, you know, no longer uh, racist or whatever, uh, or now I'm woke or whatever the word may be, that I hope that it is a part of the journey that other people have on the arc and they stay on it and they continue to climb higher and climb higher even as they dig deeper. The other thing for me though, Michelle, and all of in these 
weekends and these conversations and through film one, I have enjoyed being able to be in conversation uh, with other sort of uh, black film critics, scholars and others and the excitement of, of engaging these conversations with them and being able to say, not have to say stuff sometimes, you know, and someone that you're in there that gets it. The other thing, however, is that, and you and I, Michelle, have had these conversations before and recently, that, you know, you get tired of teaching folk and I'm not here to teach folk uh, how to be woke, uh, uh, to use that word. And I don't feel like the burden's on me when we're in these conversations around film, mm -hmm. right? That I'm, you know, I don't have to uh, be the one uh, giving all of my energy teaching people. People are responding and, and people are in the room. Some people perhaps more vulnerable than others, but sharing a sort of common vulnerability that they came into the room. You know, think of the people black and white who decide to come into the room to watch these films that we know are gonna stir emotions. And then you're coming into the National Cathedral to do it, which if for people some that feels like a safe space and for others it doesn't. And so everyone is coming in with a level of vulnerability and giving of themselves, even if they're just sitting there. And I, because the film's there and they can respond to it, I don't have to be, and neither, neither do the other black folks in the room, have to be the teachers about race. Mm -hmm. So, you know what I love is you all have just given a half hour conversation for when we are live in the cathedral again. <laughs> <laughs> to get people to actually show up and be in that space. So I want to turn a little bit to like, what, what would you suggest that if people aren't in a space together, right? But they're right. watching film and they're really hungry, right? Watching film because of a desire for transformation, because of a desire to hear a story that's really different from mine, because of a desire to connect a little bit more to who folks are. So how do you watch how do you watch film in that way, right? Can both of you speak a little bit to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I was reading a ton of stuff about how much people are streaming and watching and reading. Um, I had an advisory committee meeting with our friends at Church Publishing, the um, publishing arm of the Episcopal Church yesterday. And they're so excited that people are reading books in this time. <laughs> and, you know, we are, we are doing everything we can. You know, we're, we're reading, we're watching, we're baking. Um, and, and all of those things are powerful things. Um, what I'm talking with my students about this semester is about making connections to their own lives. And, um, um, you know, Kelly talks a lot about sort of moral imagination and how we sort of understand what we're called to do uh, because of the things that stories spark in us. And um, so what, what I try and encourage people to do is to think about not just what's being communicated and how they're resonating emotionally, but what is sparking for them spiritually. Um, so for example, Ca Casablanca is, is one of our films that we're showing, um, showing in our, our film festival this spring. <laughs> and um, I just got finished, well, sort of teaching it today. I actually got knocked off the interwebs halfway through class today. Um, so our power went out and I'm looking at all these frozen screens and I'm like, oh, you pee. Oh, it's me. Oh, it's actually me. So, um, but what we were going to talk about, and we'll probably talk about um, in, in a couple of weeks when we come back, is that the Humphrey Bogart character is a character who is emblematic of all of us. Um, the, the New Testament Greek word that is connected to the Humphrey Bogart's Rick character is metanoia. Um, metanoia is translated usually in the New Testament, the Christian Testament as repentance. But what it actually refers to is this 180 degree turn from, from where you are to where you're supposed to be. And so we'll, we'll talk more about this with our panel, but the, the most important uh, phrase that Rick utters in the early film is he says, I stick my neck out for nobody. And that is spiritual death right there. You cannot be a spiritually involved person to live out of that kind of selfishness and heartbreak. 
And we understand through the film that he is a broken person. And so his community helps to make him less broken so that he's becomes a person who can stick his neck out and, and live for other people and take those chances. Um, but it, it's a really powerful and universal spiritual theme. And, you know, so it's theological in the sense, you know, that Kelly and I are Christian theologians. And so we can talk about this phrase metanoia, and we can talk about repentance, and we can talk about becoming the people that God has called us to be. But it's also like universally spiritual, because you cannot be a decent human being mm -hmm. if all you care about is yourself. And so becoming a person willing to stick your neck out is an essential spiritual um, story, as well as an essential Christian story. And that is, that is what Casablanca is about. Become a person better than you are. Make the world better. Take chances. Get past your own heartbreak. And, and those are all such powerful things. And like I've seen, I was telling my class before I got cut off today, I've seen Casablanca 50 times. There is never a time when I watch it where I'm not impressed by that message. Mm -hmm. And so whatever else we bring to it, and there's lots of other things that we'll talk about with the panel, but it is important that we interrogate our stories for their spiritual meanings. What do they have to tell us about who we can be and how we should live? And, and that's what I love about film. And that's what Kelly was talking about earlier. So it, it's, it is that shared narrative that Toni Morrison was talking about that lets us live outside of ourselves and experiment with other ways of being and take those lessons back into our own lives. Yeah, thanks, Greg, uh, for that. First, let me say this. Sometimes you just, and I know we all do this, and, and, and believe you me, so do I, uh, probably more often than not, you just want to watch. You don't care how good the film is, how deep the film is. Let's, let's first be clear that it's about entertainment, right? And that, and that has its own, and I should say, so you can't take the... The, theology out of the theologian at any point. And that has its own merit because play, laughter, humor, as one uh, uh, sociologist of religion, Peter Berger says, that is a signal of transcendence, right? Wow. That, that, that moment that you laugh and you can laugh is sort of God breaking in you know, and helping you to understand even the joy of life. And sometimes laughter is what breaks in because you laugh when something is so absurd. And, and so the paradox between the way things are and the way they should be. So, you know, but, so, but, but don't, don't, even if the movie isn't all that deep, the fact that you're in that moment, that's a signal of transcendence. You know, because life, life is meant not to, to uh, it's meant to be enjoyed. There's a joy to life. And that's the kind that we can be in that moment and have the privilege perhaps of being in that moment should indicate to us that we want a world where other people can have the privilege of being in that moment and feeling the joy of life. So that's the first thing I want to say uh, about film. Even if it's a silly film, it means something, right? But the other thing, when we're in these realities now of, uh, and I like the way Michelle deftly pointed out, you all are talking like we can be gathered in the cathedral together watching it, right? People are going to be watching this on their computer on a little box or something by themselves. And oftentimes, that's what we do. So, so how do we do that and, and get any meaning of that? I often say to people, whether you're reading a book, I say this to people, particularly even as we uh, read the Bible and interrogate different stories, always try to enter into the story through a door that is not your own, through a door that you would not ordinarily go through. Because we know that we all, when we first see a film or read a book, we identify immediately with a particular character or we go through a certain lens, a certain eye. And try to intentionally 
go through somebody else's eyes and door. Try to identify with the character whose experience is unlike yours, right? And that's what I often say, even when you're watching in this solitary way, or when you leave the film, you know, because you might want to be in the film, you're enjoying it. But when you leave it and you reflect upon it, try to go in through a different door and a different experience, because this is what film can do. It can help us experience realities that we ordinarily would not get to uh, experience. It's not the, that reality, but it can open up perspectives and open up questions for us if indeed we allow it to do that. And so if you're if you're watching it alone, just go through a different door. And, and if you've seen the film more than once, I mean Greg seen Castlebanka 50 times, I will confess I have not and I don't plan on it. But uh but <laughs> if you see every time you see it, try to go in through a different door that's not yours. Sounds like film watching is spiritual discipline, which, <laughs> right? Like, which, and, and right. for those of us who, who are practicing a faith of some kind, it doesn't have to be a Christian faith, but there's there's practices that That's go right. along with it. And what I hear you describing, and Greg, sort of what you referred to at the beginning in terms of an opportunity to be in a story that is not our own, is a practice of that, right? And so for so many of us, it's something that we have to work on, we have to learn that we don't, even if we did it as a child, that's that right. somehow we don't all, always continue that. And that that is, that's also yeah. part of being in human community. Greg, you look like you're jumping in there. Well, I was, I was just going to, I was going to say that I, I love what Kelly talked about joy and, and fun. Um, my son Chandler, who's now 23, um, he took me to so many terrible kids movies and he loved every single one of them and he did not want to hear me dissect them he did not want to hear me be critical <laughs> about them he said dad I had a good time and there is that very powerful sense you know Kelly used the word transcendence I had a good time is actually plenty good and so I, I, I think that I would uh, kind of amend my earlier statements, if I could, uh, I don't know, can I offer a friendly amendment to that? <laughs> it's like, yes, pay attention, uh, but also be present, you know, and, and take, what's, take what's joyful about it. And, you know, so, you know, when Kelly and I talk about guess who's coming to dinner, you know, there, there are critical and theological comments, but there's also just Kelly used to talk to me about how beautiful Sidney Poitier is. <laughs> he still is. <laughs> and I'm like, that is, that is a real thing. That's a theological point right there. But so you know what, this, this is, this is not, you know, I, I, I'll say this quickly, uh, Michelle, because what you know, Greg I, said about enjoying film with his, with his son. And of course, you know, when we have, uh, little kids in our lives. We uh, see shows and films we just never would do on our own, but I was introduced to a whole new world of SpongeBob and everything else as my son was growing up. But I remember, and I like this, be present and let yourself be present regardless. I remember mm -hmm. sitting in a film with uh, my son, who's now uh, 28, but I think he was in high school and we were watching, uh, what is it? Is, is it War Horse, I think uh, was the film. Mm -hmm. And we're both sitting there watching it and watching this film. And at, we didn't weren't talking to each other all through the film. And I wasn't sure whether, because I drug him to it, I wasn't sure whether or not he was enjoying it. And I was thinking, oh, I'm going to get it, hear it now from my teenage son after we get out of this film. And as the credits were rolling, he didn't jump up. And I usually like to sit and watch the credits. So I didn't jump, but he didn't jump up. And we both looked at each other at the same time and said, wow, I liked that film. And this just sometimes big, be, be, I don't even know what this, the feeling that it leaves you with. And so mm -hmm. I agree. And that is, that it, because film takes you, no matter how good or how uh, poor, bad, 
it does take you to a deeper place within yourself, even if it's a deeper place of joy or you find yourself sometimes you don't mm-hmm. know why you're crying in a dang on film. Uh, to, but it takes you to this deeper place. And so Michelle, you're right, there's this there is spiritual meaning to it, and it doesn't always have to be, it's not contrived. And sometimes just sit in it, right? Sit yeah. with who you are in that moment and what was it that that film evoked in you? You all are doing this beautifully. One of the questions that came in ahead of time was, okay, so for those of us who aren't trained theologians, right? We haven't gone to theology school. We haven't taken those classes. Help us see how we can watch a film with some level in, level of theology. And I think you both have done that, right? To invite us into mm-hmm. watching film, not just for the storyline, but for the spiritual experiences that characters are having or the, the moments that we're having. And I just want to draw that out for folks who are watching, right? Because if we haven't, if we're not studiers of film, we're not film critics and we're not theologians. Mm-hmm. I think we love film because there is something that you all are are sort of unpacking for us about the experience of watching film that we can then do a little bit more intentionally, right? That we can do more intentionally than we might otherwise, but it's part of why we're already there in the first place, right? That's right. Because films, their stories are connected to humans. That's right. You just said that well, Michelle, in, in, in that last remark. that's why we go in the first place you know so it's asking us what mm-hmm. is what it was bringing us there and what's keeping us there and and enjoying the moment in in yourself right because after all it, it, in the end you're it is about the individual viewer <laughs> right and so even if you're in a crowded room it's you in the film uh, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 in, and enjoying that, or, or living deeply into it. And Lord knows, I'm not a film critic. I just like movies, uh, yeah. <laughs> and make it a part of, and do make it a part of of, of my work because they help me uh, in doing my theology. And often I reference them. So go ahead, Greg. Go ahead. No, I was I was going to jump in very quickly and maybe give a rubric that would be useful to people. Okay. Uh, because over the years, uh, my teaching and, and writing, uh, I've I found kind of four, four <laughs> archetypal <laughs> spiritual stories that, um, that we all are wrestling with. And uh, this, this might be a useful way to think about film and novels and, and memoir and, 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 you know, I don't know, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, who knows. Um, but there, there are four really important universal stories that we tell over and over again. And, and part of them are in our faith traditions, uh, but they're, they're also just you know human stories that we wrestle with. So, so one of them is the story of brokenness. Um, so we, we are broken. Um, there, we live in an imperfect world. We're, we're very clear about that. Um, and, and so part of our journey in, in a, a really powerful story is from brokenness to something more like wholeness. Um, so that, that's a story that we tell a lot. So in, in the Christian tradition, we talk about lost and found. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I was lost and now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. So the, the, the story of brokenness is a really powerful spiritual story. Uh, the story of home, where do I belong? Um, and that is, there are all these journey stories uh, throughout our, our history, from the ancient Greeks to the present, which are about kind of finding our way back home to the place where we belong. Um, the third story is the powerful story of community. And in the book, I talk about this in connection with Casablanca, because Rick's journey is in community. You know, Sam and Ilsa and Louis and all of these other characters in Casablanca are a part of his journey to becoming who he's supposed to be. Uh, community, Barbara Brown Taylor says, rubs the rough edges off of us and helps us to become the people that we're called to be. And like, I am a capital I introvert as I think you guys know, but I become more and more aware as the years go by how much I need community, how much I need you, how much I need other people to speak back to me and to help me understand things. And then, and then the last thing, the fourth thing is, is what I call heroism. Um, and when we talk about crash, 
Um, the theological point that I make in the book is a, about what Dr. King called um, sort of a, a heroic unselfishness. Um, our, our willingness to step out of our comfort zone and to help others and to live, as we were talking about with Rick in Casablanca, for something more than ourselves. And, and whether we talk about Joseph Campbell's hero's journey or whether we talk about it just in terms of moving away from our own selfishness and sort of uh, like solipsism uh, into a place where we are willing to sacrifice and to give. And, and so those are four really powerful universal themes mm -hmm. that we can look for in almost every story that, that might be helpful as people read or watch or listen. Um, and, and that's just sort of, that's kind of my collective wisdom uh, from the teaching years, but I, I come back to those, those themes over and over again as a way to engage meaningly, theologically or spiritually or otherwise, with any kind of story. So Kelly, I want you to answer that, and then I'm just going to say we're going to shift and grab some of the questions that are coming in. So while Kelly's yeah. answering, I want to remind folks that use the, you can use the Q&A function, and, um, and then Margaret, if you can get Leonard, and I think Doris is also going to come on to ask us a question. Um, so Kelly, over to you, but I wanted to give a little Yeah, bit of no, just, I wasn't going to say anything uh, uh, in particular in relationship to that, except uh, just a couple things, uh, quick things. One, I can't wait till we discuss these movies, because I don't think Greg and I are going to have the same responses to Casablanca or Crash. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> so, so we will see. And I like those, I like those themes. You read them uh, through your book, and I can't wait to, to dissect that a little bit. And the other, other thing that I simply wanted to say about my enjoyment of uh, film uh, and Joy is, you know what? to see navigating uh, life in this country as uh, uh, with Ebony Grace and a culture and a nation and a society that uh, doesn't affirm you and you don't always see yourself, especially uh, in the times in which I navigated. Sometimes I just get the sheer joy a lot of times of just seeing black people on film mm -hmm. and I it just I walk out and feel uh, affirmed and to see and there's nothing more powerful to me than seeing black people being able to tell their own story and that's in the way that they would tell it and that's what Get Out does. That's what Black Panther does. That you, you tell your own story and see Black people on film. And that joy, sometimes I can just walk away and say, ah. Oh. Beautiful. And film hasn't always been that way. That's this right. Country, right. And so, uh, so folks who may not know, so what we're going to do on March 2nd, um, yeah, here come our folks. So March 2nd, um, at Kelly and Greg are coming back. We'll be joined by Philip Rodriguez, who's a documentary filmmaker from LA and uh, um, Sonia Williams for a conversation specifically about Casablanca and Crash and Black Panther. And, and we'll talk mm -hmm. more about the, the historical movement of film, the what Kelly calls the moral imaginary, right? The thing that we're calling mm -hmm. to um, about those particular films. So um, right now I wanna welcome Doris Mabry, who's one of our uh, um, watchers tonight who sent in this great question that we wanted to invite you to ask on screen. So I'm so glad you're here to, um, and I just invite you to ask your question to Kelly and Greg. Let's see what they have to say. Okay, my, my question is not about a film that's in your book. It, it's um, when I was a child in elementary school, my dad actually was my principal <laughs> and he took the whole school. I, I lived in central Georgia mm -hmm. and um, for some, how, somehow they got the local theater 
to reserve an afternoon and he took the whole school to the movies to see Song of the South. Mm -hmm. And we went to see Song of the South, I'm sure primarily because there were black people in it in significant roles and they had all these Uncle Rima stories that we had learned growing up. Years later, I had a friend who, it was his 50th birthday. And I realized, somehow I figured out that Song of the South came out the year he was born. And mm. I wanted to get a video of that to give him as a birthday present. When I went to the store to get the video, they said it was not available. It was a racist movie and they couldn't sell it. And uh, I was, I guess I was kind of surprised. Um, and I said, I guess I realized that it is a racist movie. <laughs> but um, when I was a child, you know, it, it, it showed black people in significant roles in the movie. So I kind of identify with what Reverend Doug Douglas said about seeing black people in movies. But my question is, um, can you talk some about the differences that you know, stages of life and age and culture, both black and white culture um, at one time have changed and how movies can help us in understanding these differences that, uh, that people have experienced. Yes, and, and Doris, my dear, um, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us tonight. Doris has been with us in the cathedral before. Uh, so it, it's a joy to, uh, to see you and to take that question. Um, that's kind of the arc that we deal with in the book, which, which goes from Birth of a Nation, which is, you know, crazy, blatantly racist, uh, to get out where, you know, as, as Kelly is saying, you know, uh, people of color are telling their own stories and acting them out on screen and, and, and there is this power to it. And so there are a bunch of stages along the way. And to kind of take my film historian piece and put it in the, the, this, this minor perspective, there are, there are movements from like sort of blatant racism, which Birth of a Nation represents and Gone with the Wind represents and Song of the South represents. Um, and this movement toward uh, representing people of color in more human roles and more identifiably uh, human um, situations. Um, and so we've got, decades and decades of white filmmakers who are, are sort of wrestling with the question of race in America and trying to do better because one of the things that we do understand about Hollywood is that they are a little more progressive in terms of race than the larger culture, but not a ton more. Um, so Song of the South is, um, it's, it's crazy problematic but it's also a really interesting film for us to talk about here at, at the Long Long Way Film Festival because we are always looking at historical and contemporary. And so Doris, what I heard you saying was, you know, these may have been racist depictions, but there were black faces on screen. And, and that was a thing. And, you know, I feel that way about Hattie McDaniel in Gone with the Wind. And I feel that way in some ways about Dooley Wilson in Casablanca. You know, in 2021, we look back at this and we say, we say these, are, these are problematic descriptions, but for people in those eras, they were, they were powerful depictions and, and they were a chance to see people who looked like themselves on screen. So the thing that I'm always wondering about, and I'm not going to answer this question, I think, but James Baldwin talks over and over again about how he wrestled with the question of whether anybody who looked like a person that he recognized as somebody who looked like himself was depicted on screen in his childhood. And um, say, I think I've, yeah, I, I do somewhere in my car. It's not a big car. Um, okay, so here is the um, book, I'm Not Your Negro. And um, Baldwin talks about a, a character in a movie called They Won't Forget. And it's a tiny, tiny piece of that film, but it's a janitor um, who is played by Clinton Rosemond, 
who played this part and he looked a little like my father. The role of the janitor is small, yet the man's race bangs in my memory until today. And so I, I think that's the tension that we're talking about, especially with historic films, that they did not do what we would want them to do, and yet they did something. And um, so I, I don't know what to go with that. I mean, one of the things that we always talk about in this film festival is here's where we've been, here's where we are now, here's how far we have to go. So um, I, I understand completely every response that people have to Song of the South or to any of the Disney films that they've sort of taken offline or that HBO did when they were uh, taking Gone with the Wind off until they could uh, present an introduction to it. And I also teach films like this because it's like Mr. Faulkner said, history is not past. We are still living in the reality of these stereotypes that are presented so powerfully in these films. And I wanna make sure that my students and I wanna make sure that my reading audience understands that this is where we come from and that these things are still present in the people marching in Charlottesville in 27, 2017 and the people marching on the Capitol in January. These, these racist stereotypes that are presented in our stories are not, are not history. Can, yes, can I, can I add Please, something? I was just gonna ask you to, yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, again, I'll be brief. Yeah, I think a couple of things. One, we always have to first understand about film when we're looking at these historical films, for instance, uh, that there's several layers of stories that a film tells or several things that we have to interrogate. And that's what I want to get us to is how we interrogate these things. One, that the film in its own time, what was its meaning in its own setting, right? Uh, what's, what was the setting? What was the story that it was telling in that setting? Uh, just, we aren't even in the content of the film yet. This, the, it's it's mm -hmm. meaning in that historical period. Then, uh, uh, and of course, the story that the writer and the director are trying to bring to it, what that story is itself, and then what the audience, the audience, what they're bringing to it and what the story is that they get from it. There are so many levels of messages that emerge because there are many stories, many layers of stories in a film. These films that were like Birth of a Nation, I have no desire to see Birth of a Nation. I know it has some historical value in terms of c cinematic value, Not, just like I don't want to see uh, what was the uh, green something with the heaven scenes of uh, 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 stereotypical and racist heaven scenes of Black people. I, I have no desire to see these things, but and what this also says, even though there's some historical value to those films and they allow us to understand uh, the where we've been and where we've gone and even understand the anti-Black narratives that are embedded uh, within our culture and even understand how film is not innocent and, uh, and that it's a part of this wider discourse of power and it's the way in which power enacts itself. And, and we see in some of these films, the way in which white supremacist anti-black power enacted itself because power enacts itself most effectively, not through being coercive, but productive, right? And creating discourse and ways of knowing and normalizing certain things that can happen in film. And it does happen through film. That film is a powerful communicator. Uh, to, uh, and so when we watch these films, out of their historical settings that are very problematic, we must, absolutely must interrogate them. And so they cannot stand on their own. 
And I re remember certainly, uh, like you, Doris, watching certain films and certain shows on TV, like, you know, Amos and Andy. And now I look back and say, oh my God, why did I like that? <laughs> but, uh, but I realized that I liked it. Not Amos and Andy weren't like anybody that I knew, like James Baldwin would say, but they were black. And, and so that's what drew me. Or why did I watch Little Rascals uh, for crying out loud with Stymie and Buckwheat? I mean- Buckwheat was my cousin. <laughs> well, you know, and they were- Me. Black. Is that true? Right. But, uh, so, right, so, but we cannot. You, we must interrogate those now, even if they have some meaning and value historically for film or whatever they have or what they tell us about culture and history, let's interrogate them that underside of what they tell us, even if there's some spark of something good in it. But so I, I just say we can't let those things stand. And, and I say the same thing about something like, you know, we look at uh, students study in school and read Shakespeare, right? And that's fine. I don't say take Shakespeare out of schools, but oh my gosh, we must interrogate the way in which Shakespeare presented his black characters, because this is a discourse that carries forth anti-blackness that subtly people take in through this discourse. You know, Othello isn't innocent. Uh, Titus Adronicus, that's not innocent. And so we have to begin to at least interrogate these things. And that's what we do try to do uh, in a long, long way. And so I think they can have meaning and value, but they cannot go on on uh, interrogated because they are not benign. This discourse is not benign and it's created and shaped a, a culture. Thank you, Kelly. Doris, thank you. Do you want to add anything? Do you want to follow up? Do you want to jump in here? <laughs> not, not really. I, I, um, I, I appreciate the, the um, both Greg and, and Reverend yeah. Douglas. I've known Greg a long time, which is why I'm taking part <laughs> in this. In this. Uh, well, thank you so much thank you. for thank being you so willing much. to come ask your question, for joining us year after year. We're so grateful. Thank you. Uh, and I want to just sort of one more thing before I hand it over to Leonard, who's going to ask us a couple questions. So, Kelly, the thing that you asked us to do is to interrogate films. And part of what I hear Greg, you saying in the book and what I heard both of you saying before is that there's also some interrogation that we do with current films, right? That it's, mm -hmm. it's this trick to both enjoying film and watching them and also being aware at what we're, about what we're seeing, right? And, and to uh, some of the people that I, I talked with after the very first Long Long Way Film Festival at the Cathedral, shared that they had never actually understood the, for guess who's coming to dinner particularly, who that film was made for. And, and those I think are questions that we can ask not just about historical films, but they're questions that we should ask that I ask myself and I don't always know how to answer them. Like sometimes I feel like I'm watching a movie and something feels off, but I don't actually have the, a way to talk about it. I don't actually know what it is that doesn't feel like it's sitting right. And so that language around interrogating is really is really helpful um, in that sense. So um, Leonard, do you want to jump in here? Do you have a question for us? And I just want to let folks know we'll go till about 820, maybe 825 or so. We're not going to keep you too long. We know you've been spent a long time on Zoom already. We're so grateful, but we want to be able to bring some of your questions into this space too before we close out. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, let me say, I, I'm just grateful to be uh, invited to the conversation. Um, mm -hmm. This has been a challenge even to share questions um, that have been posed. I, I had to really catch myself because I'm in such the listening mode. Uh, this has been wonderful. Um, I thank you, Michelle. I thank you, Ken and Douglas and Dr. Garrett um, for the way that you have engaged our thoughts. And uh, even in past, uh, I guess, events, I've been really inspired and enlightened and even challenged uh, by your conversations mm -hmm. and this evening. Um, one of the pieces, and which will lead me into a question that has come up, that when you were talking about in, in, interrogating, um, there were two things that came to my mind very quickly. You know, I'll never forget um, years ago hearing Dr. Gardner-Taylor talk about how the privilege 
on film that many have and that mm. uh, there was for certain persons, Clark Gable and his opposite um, that could appear on screen at the same time. But yet for us, all we had was Amos and Andy. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so you didn't get a chance to see the both, but even to recognize the privilege that is even on screen. Um, but movies are, are and books, to me, sometimes can be for many an escape. Um, and what I appreciate that you all have pointed out is that it's a way in, mm -hmm. which leads to the question that someone has brought directly related to that. They said, how do you find and enter a door that is not your own. Mm. All right, so Kelly, that's your thing. You wanna, you wanna start that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've got some tough, but. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that, um, I wanna go back to something Michelle said earlier. There's an intentionality. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and, you know, that we have to intentionally try to identify with a character that's not us. And that might not happen as we're watching the film so that we can enjoy and, and, and live into the moment of the film. But as we begin to, because oftentimes good film has us, uh, we continue to play that film over for ourselves in our own heads and, and think about the film. And I, I, it seems to me that one of the ways is who you look at a film is who's the most undesirable character to you or who's, mm. who's, uh, who's the character that you just say, oh, that's not me. Try to get to the other, to, to engage their story. How did they get there? Uh, 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 I don't. I don't have any any uh, easy answer to that. Any uh, except to say that there has to be intentionality uh, to it, and it's no different from trying to engage the perspective of people in our own world. Uh, that's that's not our own perspective, and there has to be an intentionality about that. And so I g just say that we try to as we identify with characters in the film and the easy, the first one we identify with, then as my sister would say, ask the second question, that first one you identify with, ask the second question and find another one to identify with. Because that first mm -hmm. one is probably the easy one. Yeah, and that, I, I think that's really lovely. Uh, you know, one of the things that we learn in homiletics classes is that uh, when we, we read a passage from the Bible, we're often drawn to the people that we want to identify with. And uh, so like one of the things that my homiletics professor used to say is, where are you the Pharisee in this story? <laughs> where are you in the Gospel of John, the Jews in this story? Um, how, how do you make a connection with the people that you don't necessarily identify with immediately? Um, and, and so I love that, that approach, but I, I also have two things that I think are really kind of useful that have grown out of our conversations over the years. Um, Kelly asked a question when we showed Guess Who's Coming to Dinner um, about the maid, Tilly. And, and she is a type that appears from birth of a nation all the way through Get Out. Uh, it's, it's what James Baldwin called the faithful retainer. And Kelly uh, and I were on stage and she asked the question, why did white audiences need this character? And that was an incredible perspective for me because it opened up this whole, uh, this whole idea about, you know, she is serving a dramatic purpose, but she's also reinforcing a bunch of e ideologies and stereotypes that audiences would have needed. And then the, th I guess this is a third thing. Um, my classes will tell you, I like I ask these seven part questions, um, but I think this is the third thing if you are charting this at home. Um, I think it's also just really valuable to be in conversation in some way with people who see right. movies differently than you do. You know, so Kelly has been my partner for five years and um, has been helping me see things that I didn't see. And one of the first people who did this for me was James Baldwin, who wrote this amazing book called The Devil Finds Work, which is his uh, book of film and cultural criticism. 
And um, so there is a there is a moment toward the end of the film, the defiant ones. And again, our beautiful Sydney Poitier is in that. And as a white audience member, I was one of those people who applauded when Sidney Poitier's character jumps off the train to join Tony Curtis at the end of the film. And James Baldwin is like, you're an idiot. Why would you do that? You were on your way to freedom. You were on your way out of there. And I was like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. And you know, James Baldwin gave me all of these different readings and so I think one of the things that can be really useful for us as we, as we read and we watch is just to expose ourselves to some critical viewpoints of people that don't look like us um, and, and don't believe like us and don't think like us because they can help us to see through their viewpoint. And uh, so I think that's a really lovely thing about that, that whole enter into the person who is not you. And uh, so I, I think that's gonna be a fun thing for us to talk about in the panel in a couple of weeks uh, because we've got we've got several films that have a bunch of different viewpoints and I'm really looking forward to, to thinking about those. Hey Greg, um, I am we've been talking about interrogating and about learning and I'm wondering if I can have your permission to have a little bit of a risky conversation with you about something that you just said. Yeah, of course you can. <laughs> so, and to those watching, I just want to name that I, I, Greg and I have a relationship. We've been working on this for, for about five years. And so. Yeah, friends um, for a long time. So yeah, yeah jump in, tell, tell me yeah, what I did. So, so you were, well, so I want to just sit, sit, tell you what I heard. So you were talking about the scripture and how we read scripture and asking mm -hmm. people to take a look at the characters that they don't want to be. And one of the characters that you described was the Jews in the Gospel of and, John. And go ahead, do you know what I'm gonna say? <laughs> yes, uh, I am actually Tuesday night getting ready to be on a program talking about Christian anti-Semitism. Aha. And um, so here, here is my background. I am, and, um, and Leonard and Kelly will identify with, with my problem. Because I don't serve in a church, I am asked to preach over and over again on Easter too. And um, that is uh, what Rowan Williams calls rector's holiday. So, you know, um, you know, all of the people who serve in churches have done all of Holy Week and they need a little time off. And so there is a moment in the gospel reading for Easter 2, which is the, the Thomas the Doubter story, where it talks about how the, um, the disciples have gathered and locked themselves in a room for fear of the Jews. And of course, everybody in that room is Jewish and, Jew and Jesus was Jewish. And so uh, one of the things, like if I could make this as clear as I could, one of the things we wrestle with in the gospel of John is that there is this, um, this family dispute going on uh, between different Jewish communities. And uh, so um, like if I could sort of clarify what I was saying earlier with my air quotes, um, the Jews are made to be um, a sort of enemy despite the fact that everybody in the Christian gospels is Jewish. And uh, so that, that I think is maybe a response to what you were asking. Um, and if I haven't clarified it yet, I, I trust that, uh, that you and Kelly will fix it. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to fix wanted... it. You're going to have to fix it. But uh, what, I, what I will say is this, and it, just exactly what I said earlier in relationship even to film, that's problematic, uh, the way in which we must own the fact. And mm -hmm. even in the translations, and we do not have to continue to translate that in the way in which yes. it's translated, because that is not an appropriate translation, that it is not an appropriate theological translation, that does not get across yeah. the point that is being made. And that is, we have to look, just as we look at, we have to look at this light, dark stuff that is the precursor to anti-Blackness and is interwoven into uh, Christian theological architecture, also interwoven into Christian theological architecture is anti-Semitism that has yeah, to yeah. be interrogated, that has to be taken out, that and and that and those translations are not 
necessary translations and they are not mm. theologically uh, uh, appropriate translation. So I just want to say that I heard that as well, Michelle, but it's a good, it's, this is, and for those listening, these are the kind of conversations that are uh, the, the tough but necessary conversations that move us all forward. And so, which is why I like being in these conversations with Greg yeah. and, 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 and with Michelle. And this is, I like that Michelle brought that up because this is what real authentic being on the ark is all about, but but I appreciate you raising that because that is problematic and 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 it's problematic. That's what we mean by interrogating uh, the the text and the narrative. And we know that we that does not have to be uh, the translation uh, uh, because it's an inappropriate translation. Good, I love that. And I, I I'm going to take interrogate and I'm going to make my my verb confront. <laughs> um, because I, I think that that is something that has to happen every time that shows up in the Gospel of John, um, mm -hmm. because right. it is it is at the heart of this Christian anti-Semitism, and I, I love the way that you have said we do not have to even regard this as something worth um, you know uh, reading in the translation. This is um, something let's let's set it aside and recognize uh, how hateful and hurtful it is. And let's let's deal with the the gospel texts in 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 more important ways because um, there there are teachings there in the the doubting Thomas text of Easter too, um, and yet I feel like every time I preach it I have to stand up and confront that that translation that we find in our prayer book. Greg, this is why I really love working with you. I just I really so appreciate. There's. Um, I, I know you to be the kind of person who's going to be on a panel and in a conversation about Christian anti-Semitism, right? I know that that's your heart. I know that's that that's your intention. And so, yeah, we're doing some real-time learning here. And Greg, you've just been so graciously modeled a, a way of listening and hearing and um, and doing that publicly. So, uh, um, I confirm. Thank you. <laughs> so grateful. I okay. affirm that. That's so, why I'm in this. Now you, Michelle, right? you asked me at the beginning why I was in this conversation with Greg and why I stayed in it for five years. This is why. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And we all learn something too, right? Like, that's it's right. not like Greg's mm -hmm. the only one doing learning. In this. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring us back to some film conversation here. Leonard, I think you have at least one more question for us. <laughs> that, that, is, that is the film conversation. I, it, it, was, it was happening um, while we yeah. were going on because I, I think it reflects um, what came up earlier in your conversation about the intentionality. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, I appreciate uh, not just your question as you posed it um, and Dr. Douglas, uh, but Greg, your response, the willingness to be intentional um, mm -hmm. in the moment of both asking the question and receiving a response. Without either one, there is no dialogue. We just simply are talking into uh -huh. the air. Um, and so we have to bring ourselves to this, which I think we're all working on, um, to bring ourselves uh, as vulnerable um, and make ourselves vulnerable that we can mm -hmm. Uh, often, as we describe, be broken apart so that we can be put back together in the right way. Um, yeah. and, and that was taking place, which was just wonderful. Um, let me say you all have answered a question that was, someone thought it was a basic question, but I think you answered it. I just want you to know that they were asking, how did you, or how do you interrogate, or what do you mean by interrogating a film? So I thank you for really answering that question while you were dialoguing, not knowing that the question was hovering out there, um, that someone really wanted to know that, thought it was basic, but you, you, you really dug into that. Uh, there was, to, to ask a particular question that someone asked is that um, they wanted, to, they were wondering, could you address the issue of, is that white showrunners writing dialogue mm -hmm. for black indigenous people of color um, and characters? Um, who exists now. Um, how, how do you see that or your thoughts on that? Mm. Uh, 
Well, in, in the book, and, and Kelly, jump in after I say my little piece. I, I, I'm looking at a progression um, because, you know, one of the things that part of, you know, my five-year journey in doing these conversations has led me to understand is how limited my, my point of view is. And as compassionate as I want to be and as involved in justice work as I want to be, I'm, I still get up in the morning and I look in the mirror and I'm, I'm me, right? Uh, this white middle-class middle-aged guy who's sitting in his Prius. And um, there, there is a certain limitation to my angle of vision. And even as a creative writer, even as a creative person, there are things that I don't feel like I can touch in the same way that, person who, that a person who has had that experience can touch. And, and so one of the reasons that I, I wanted to sketch that arc in the book toward people of color telling their own stories and directing their own films and acting in their own films is just that I feel like as universal as I feel some experiences might be, my experience still proves itself day by day to be very limited. So like I, I am in this little window here on my screen and I'm in this little window in my life. And so one of the things that I think is optimistic as I think about what's happening in Hollywood is that um, more black directors, more Latinx directors, more Asian directors, more um, women. I mean, when I look at the Golden Globes this year, I'm really delighted at the ways that um, people who have not always traditionally been represented are telling their own stories. And, um, you know, so at, at the end of the day, that's kind of where I am. Um, I am trying my best to see, but I know how limited my vision is. And so I trust people from different experiences to be able to tell their stories in ways that people who look like me would not be able to. Yeah, no, Greg, the reason I remain quiet at first is because you you answer this question in your book. And I like really the way in which you trace the arc in your book uh, from the time of uh, 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 people of color not being able to tell their story and they're being told in stereotypic ways, carrying forth uh, tropes, uh, stereotypic tropes to people being able to tell their own stories. And so I just think the more that people can the more that film <laughs> and all of that industry looks like our nation and people yeah. get to tell their stories and a variety of people uh, get to tell their stories in a variety of different ways, I think the better off we are. So I like actually the way in which I learned uh, even in your book, that arc uh, and the way in which you tell that uh, of how film moves. It's never gonna be perfect. But that's why we have to, that's the long, long way, right? That's why we have to stay on the arc. So I think you're right. And, and we're finding more, it's, uh, it is about more than representation. And it's, uh, but representation also matters because through that representation, people mm -hmm. are able to tell their own story. I think you all have just given us a fabulous wrap up, right? Because we're gonna talk next week much, or next, next month, March 2nd, we're gonna touch mu talk much more specifically about those particular films and what story they tell about the arc of uh, race mm. and film. Um, uh, hope you all come back and join us on March 2nd. Uh, free with donations requested. Really grateful to those of you who have made donations to be here tonight. Uh, it helps to support Thank the work you. of the cathedral and the, the ways that we can continue to be a, a voice, a beacon, a conversation in the world to all host programs like this. So we're glad you're here. And I was so excited to start the conversation. I forgot to pray us in. So I'm wondering, Leonard, if you would pray us out. <laughs> and then um, I want to first make sure we say thank you to Margaret and to Kate Caitlin for a run yeah. in the back of the house, making sure that that chat Thank is filled and we've got our questions. So we couldn't really do it at all without the, the Zoom land um, the team who helps make this stuff happen. So, and then if our panelists want to stick around for just a few minutes, stay, we'll turn your cameras off, stick around. We'll do a little bit of debrief um, after uh, folks have a chance to exit the room. So. Thank you both so much. And I won't get to talk to you in March. So th thank you for the privilege for being in conversation with me tonight. I'm really- no. Thank you, Michelle. Delightful. Exactly. All right, Leonard, over to you. Certainly, as always, the invitation is extended for those who are so inclined to join me as we offer a word of prayer. 
Almighty now, as we are recognizing the close of an evening, in anything that we might see closing, may we also see where new beginnings are existing in the space. May this conversation lead us to deeper understandings, greater relationships, and vision that is not just within our grasp, but vision that we might have to move from where we are to gain clarity and to experience the blessings in that moment. So we thank you for all who have gathered and ask now that you would bless each and every one, the homes and the families in these days and times, that you would keep us and cover us and fill us, that we might be prepared for all the places that you will send us. This we ask in your wonderful name, amen. 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 And thank you to the March on Washington Film Festival and the Austin Film Festival who are also partners. I forgot to say yes. that part too. So um, uh, Broderick and Colin, thank you so much for all of your support as well. <laughs> and so y'all, we hope to see you on March 2nd. Enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, we'll see you back next time.